Hi, this is Dr. Ted Rosen, Professor of Dermatology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Republic of Texas. And we're going to talk about palliative care in dermatology. I know this is not exactly a topic you would think of in dermatology, but actually we do a lot of palliative care. And my point in showing this is not to give you a lot of practical pearls like I usually do, but my point in showing this is to try and encourage you to think about ways you can do palliative care for selective patients in dermatology. So this is my conflict of interest. These relationships have all ended and none of them are relevant to this presentation anyhow. So when we think of palliative care, when I say palliation, you probably, and rightfully so, think treating or taking care of a dying cancer patient, don't you? But it can mean much more. The actual definition and the implementation of palliative care includes a lot more than care for the dying cancer patient. And yes, it is relevant to dermatology. So what's palliation? What you're doing is you're improving the quality of life. You're easing symptoms. This is not intended to cure. And that's a very important point. It's associated with serious or terminal disease. And it doesn't have to just be cancer. It can be end stage organ failure or neurodegenerative disease or other serious or terminal diseases. Or it could be improving the quality of life, easing symptoms, not curing, non-life-limiting diseases. The first three compose the definition of palliation. It's not the same as end-of-life care. It's not the same as hospice care. Palliation, palliative care does not always mean that the patient is dying and does not mean that their life expectancy is six months or less. And importantly, palliative care can begin at any time along a disease course. So we have life prolonging or disease directed care. And then towards the end, we may have hospice care, but palliative care can span the entire disease duration. And I, I know this isn't the way you normally think of palliative care, but I'd like you to consider it in that light because that's really the definition of palliative care. And the earlier you introduce palliative care, the more beneficial it can be. And this is based on randomized controlled trials, looking at how effective, how beneficial palliation can be. It may consist of, for example, pain management, physical and emotional support, not only of the patient, but of the patient's family or the patient's caregivers, if they are or aren't family members. It can be the alleviation of any distressing or overwhelming symptoms. Palliative care may include improving the quality of life for the patient and their family, planning for complications that are known to be associated with whatever the underlying illness is. And yes, it can include planning for death in certain cases, in many cases. But we perform palliation every single day. You don't believe me, but let me give you an example. 
if you accept, and this is the accepted definition of palliation, if you accept that it includes alleviation of distressing or overwhelming symptoms and improves the quality of life for the patient and their family, then this patient with widespread psoriasis who receives adalimumab and now looks like this, that's palliation, right? You believe distressing or overwhelming symptoms. She itched like 90% of psoriasis patients do, 60 to 75% of them itch every single day. And she had distress over the cosmetic appearance of this. It was equally on the front and on the extremities. I'm just showing you the easiest thing to photograph. So I alleviated her distressing symptoms and therefore improved the quality of her life. That's palliation by definition, and you do it every single day, don't you? Here's another example, maybe one you wouldn't think of. This woman with burning and stinging of her face, really bad facial sensitivity, along with erythema she couldn't even cover with makeup, along with papules and pustules all over her face, you know what she has. She has rosacea. And so by giving her modified release doxycycline, she now looks like this. That's palliation because you've alleviated distressing or overwhelming symptom. The burning, stinging of her face, her inability to hide this redness and these bumps, it improved the quality of her life. And did I cure that patient with psoriasis? No, you know what will happen if she stops her adalimumab or if it stops working, it'll come back. Did I cure this patient of rosacea? No. Was I intending to cure her? No, but I was intending to relieve symptoms and improve her quality of life. That's palliation. And you do this every single day. You see what I'm talking about? physical and emotional support of family and caregivers, emotional support. You know, if you don't know numbers, percentages, you know, you feel it. High rates of anxiety and depression and even post-traumatic stress syndrome among dermatology patients with serious diseases, both acute diseases like calciphylaxis, which hurts like hell, or reactive states like Stevens-Johnson or TEN, and chronic diseases like incurable neoplasia or collagen vascular disease, chronic disease, anxiety, depression, emotional components, not just physical. Now, I don't expect you or me to function as a mental health professional, but what I want you to do is remember that relieving the emotional components of the disease is part of palliation. I'm encouraging you to think about what you do in a palliative sense. And in order to do that, consider the mental health status of your patient and be willing and able to suggest individuals who can directly address this. Mental health professionals, not you or I, but if someone's really distressed, have in your back pocket the names of psychiatrists or psychologists who can help out these patients. Social workers can often also be of great help in improving emotional functioning. How about the role of faith and religion? For some patients, that's very, very important. I'm going to give you an example of a patient where this was very helpful. So this is typically associated with serious and terminal disease. We've said that. But you can deliver palliation concurrently with life prolonging or disease-directed care. Believe it or not, 
If you code something as a palliative intervention, insurance coverage is actually quite good. And it's felt by everybody who's an expert in this field, palliation, that the to treating healthcare provider should be the one responsible for basic palliative care and that you re should refer to specialists when it's needed. But you should be because you already have that relationship with the patient. So you should at least try and offer the basics of palliative care. In some derm offices, there are lots of older patients. I'm older. Many of my patients have grown old with me. So they need palliative care. In some derm offices, there's a lot of immunosuppressed patients, collagen vascular disease, and others. They may have complications which lead to symptoms that require palliative care. For rare, serious, and symptomatic skin diseases, like calciphylaxis, like epidermolysis bullosa, do you think that the primary care doctor or other primary care healthcare provider can offer palliation when they know nothing about the disease and its natural history? We're the experts in these rare, serious, symptomatic diseases. We should be the ones giving palliative care. And then serious malignant disease where we take the initial lead role. Advanced melanoma. Yes, it is likely for advanced melanoma. There may be a surgical oncologist involved. There may be a medical oncologist involved, but you can help. You can be supportive and you can be part of the team, like surveying the patients for future melanomas. Advanced CTCL, I'm going to give you an exact example of that and where we can offer palliative care, even though there may be a medical oncologist delivering the primary care for the disease. And advanced non-melanoma skin cancer, we can offer palliative care. And you may co-manage these things, like with collagen vascular disease, there may be a rheumatologist involved. There may be a rheumatologist involved, at least giving some of the drugs, like rituximab for bullous diseases. But you're still the person who likely made the diagnosis, started the patient on their path of therapy, and can offer palliative care when it's appropriate. This will widely vary from situation to situation. I think, unfortunately, the principles of palliative care are not routinely part of dermatology training anywhere. There's no structured palliative care courses targeting dermatology providers. And yet it's been shown that as little as an hour to a full day course, but even an hour. So I'm giving you a little bit less than an hour, but I'm giving you something can improve our ability to deliver palliative care. Let me give you some concrete examples. So this is a 64-year-old married physician who developed stage 1B mycosis fungoides. He did not respond to ultrapotent topical steroids, failed UVB phototherapy, failed topical nitrogen mustard, and failed topical bexeratine gel all administered by dermatology, and now presents as stage 2B with tumors in excess of one centimeter in more than one anatomic and three anatomic areas. I'm just showing you his face. The patches and plaques that he has all itch. The ulcerated tumors hurt, and there's constant serosanguinous drainage. Because of his facial involvement, look at his upper lip and his lower lip. Because of his facial involvement, he has to stress speaking, very difficult ability to speak. He actually quit work as a physician because he couldn't communicate. 
what are the palliative care issues there? Yes, he has cancer that needs to be treated, but there are also palliative issues. And that's what I'm urging you to look for, look at, and offer solutions. There are some clues right there in his history. So therapeutics, yes, with all of what he has going on, maybe he's a candidate for a total skin electron beam or a variety of chemotherapeutic and immunomodulatory interventions, which I have listed there. That's therapeutics, but there still is room for palliative care. How about his pain, reducing his pain? Analgesia, numbing medicine even. How about controlling his itching? Steroid, pramoxine, antihistamines, and other methods of controlling itching. And who's better at doing that? Do you think it's the oncologist who might be administering Brentuximab Vidotin? No, it's you and me who know how to control itching. How about absorbing the ooze from his open ulcers? We know about dressings that can absorb serosanguinous oozing and make his life better. Speech impediment. I don't know much about speech impediments, but I sure know a good speech pathologist who can help him communicate better. And I sent him to her and he increased his ability to communicate, not enough to go back to work, but enough to make his activities of daily life more easy. He's depressed because he's not working. His wife, who was his caretaker, is totally stressed. He's got two sons who are also doctors who are anxious as all get out. Mental health, he could use some mental health intervention, which I'm not expert enough to give. His wife, stressed, she could use some mental health intervention. And I even suggested to his two sons, who I know in passing, that they could use some counseling. So I could intervene for pain. I could intervene for itching. I could help absorb that oozing. But then I could also direct him to others to administer the palliation I'm not capable of doing. This gentleman was Jewish, and he was very, very religious. So I went to, I know what synagogue he goes to. I went to his rabbi and I said, your congregant, my patient, needs faith. He needs you now. He hadn't told his rabbi. The rabbi went to his house and offered him spiritual comfort, which when he finally did pass, his wife sent me a beautiful note saying that was the best thing I could have ever done for him because when he died, he died at peace. That's palliation. I couldn't serve as his healer, his faith giver, but I could make sure he got appropriate palliative care because for him, faith was important. Here's another case study, 81-year-old male, multiple comorbidities. Oh my God, he's got coronary artery disease, he's got renal insufficiency, poorly controlled hypertension, type two diabetes that also wasn't well controlled. He's had 28 basal cells, five squamous cells. His scalp has had multiple basal cells. They've been treated with everything you know you can treat basal cells with. He's lost to follow up. He was in good shape at that point in time, but lost to follow up for five years and then shows like this. 
shows up looking like this. And every single one of those green arrows is a biopsy, a punch. Every single one was positive for basal cell carcinoma. The ones that look like they're more substantive, the ones that are just flat erosions, all of them are basal cell carcinoma. He can't get medical clearance for surgery. And honestly, he didn't want any more surgery. He had surgical fatigue to the max. He already had radiation to the whole area. You can't re-irradiate his whole scalp. It'll all fall apart. He had type 2 diabetes that was uncontrolled, advancing renal disease, coronary artery disease. So his life expectancy is limited. His main complaint? He was oozing and bleeding from the scalp. It was dripping down onto his face. He couldn't go outdoors or engage in any social activity. And what he said, this is a direct quote. Can you make it so I can at least enjoy the few years I have left? He's asking you for palliative intervention. He knows he's going to die not maybe because of his basal cells, but he has all these other medical comorbidities that are going to lead to his death. He wants to enjoy the last few years of his life and you or I could give him good palliation. What did I do? I gave him Vismodegev and he had some side effects, all of which were controllable. So he took his Vismodegev 150 milligrams a day. He had to work up to that ultimately. Am I intending to cure all his basal cells? No way. But a lot of areas re epithelialized. He stopped oozing and bleeding. He could go out in public. He could see his friends and relatives. He could engage in social activities. And that's what he looked like. It's not cured. I'm not going to cure him. Remember, palliation is not curative, but I improved his quality of life greatly. That's what palliation is. Improving the quality of his life, making it better, that's a victory. And he had a good two years before he died of a heart attack. But those two years were worth the effort that I put in to take care of his adverse events, to graduate him in to almost daily Vismodegev. That was work on my part, but it was palliative, but it was worth it. Remember that unresectable skin cancer has a set of things that are associated with it. These are two papers from the same group. And I'm gonna show you a, a list rather than go through that graph. Pain, anorexia, dyspnea, drowsiness, anemia, fatigue, bleeding and exudate, insomnia, nausea, and paralysis, all can be associated with advanced skin cancer, including non-melanoma skin cancer. Some of these may be multifactorial. For example, shortness of breath, could be due to a lung mess. It could be due to anemia because he's lost so much blood from bleeding from the skin cancer. Pain could be due to bone metastases or local neuroinvasion. Some are highly interrelated. Chronic bleeding causing anemia, anemia worsening fatigue, drowsiness, and dyspnea. The bottom line is these are all related to advanced skin cancer. Who made that diagnosis of skin cancer? Who administered the first therapy? Probably you. So you should think about if these things are presenting now, can you do anything from a palliative standpoint to relieve them? Yes, you can relieve pain. You know how to do that. You can relieve anemia. You won't, but you know to check his blood count if he tells you he's been oozing blood from all these basal cells for a year. And if he's anemic, you can send him somewhere where he can get a transfusion. You don't have to give the transfusion. You just have to set the course. Bleeding and exudate, 
you can hyphercate, you can put on dressings that absorb that exudate, or you can treat the disease like I did as best I could, which led to enough reepithelialization that his bleeding and his exudate decreased. Would you or could you offer palliative care to this patient? Melanoma, the primary is where you see the primary up there in the axilla, but then he got all these metastatic lesions. They're unresponsive to advanced chemotherapy, including ipilimumab plus nivolumab, pembrolizumab, dibrafenib, and trametinib. No response. He has all these things. Could you offer palliative care? The answer is yes. Imiquimod, used topically. There are multiple, this is a review of the literature, and in it they show multiple case studies and case series where imiquimod topically on melanoma metastases makes many of them go away. You're not curing this disease. You're making it so he feels better about himself. There are fewer lesions that he has to see, realizing that this is going to be what does him in. Imiquimod as palliative care for melanoma metastases. That's a solid recommendation. How about this patient? OMG, right? This is an advanced basal cell carcinoma. He needs palliation. How, I'm, I'm not going to cure this. Chances are. And he'd have to have half his head removed surgically. He's already had radiation. And then he was gone for a while and then showed up like this. You see the basal cell. It's already invaded into his orbit. But hedgehog pathway could be used. Or semiplomab if hedgehog pathway didn't work or worked but stopped working. Radiotherapy maybe in areas he hadn't been previously irradiated in. How about this patient? That's a melanoma. This patient presented like this, brand new, with a melanoma, like huge and thick. He already had liver, lung, and bone metastases. Do you say, adios, amigo, there's nothing we can do? Or do you steer him to somewhere where he can get, because you don't administer it in your practice? But somebody does. He could get surgical excision, which he did. General surgeon excised this whole thing. Then he got nivolumab and ipilimumab, the most common combo therapy for advanced melanoma. His bone mets disappeared. His lung mets shrank. His liver mets stabilized. And he had a decent quality of life for a goodly long period. I didn't administer that palliative care, but I made sure he got it. And I maintained a positive attitude throughout. I encouraged him. I didn't discourage him. I encouraged him. How about this patient with a melanoma, with lymph node, liver, and lung metastases? Okay, he's going to get medical care. This is how he presented de novo, never had anything done there before. So he's going to get medical care. But his main concern was that this was oozing and the ooze smelled so bad. No one wanted to be near him. There are ways you can give palliative care for odor. You can do it. Odor comes off the skin. You know that that's the result of sweat breakdown by bacteria. Topical metronidazole. We have 0.75, we have 1%. Okay, they're for rosacea. Who knows the difference? You give them a prescription, it's applied one to two times a day. Odor may disappear. In fact, that's what was done for him. Odor was gone while he was getting appropriate medical care. That palliation should come from you and me. Masalt dressing is a salt impregnated dressing, which creates a hypertonic environment, which is very unhappy for bacteria. So they're not there to break down sweat and cause odor. It relieves odor. 
from fungating or ulcerative malignancies. Or you could use activated charcoal dressing, a little harder to come by than the Masalt, which isn't terribly expensive. Insurance covers all of these things. Why not offer him the palliative interventions we can give him while he's getting medical interventions that we ourselves may not do? Or how about her? So she has advanced discoid lupus, some scarring that you can see above her eyebrow, loss of pigment, and then hyperpigmentation around on the lower portion of her face. Can I make her skin normal again? No, I can't. I can't cure this. But I can try to improve or hide the dyschromia. That's palliation. That's alleviating distressing cosmetic symptoms and signs. And that's improving quality of life. It's palliation. Eczema laser. You might try on a spot, see if it makes repigmentation occur and doesn't promote more active lesions. Or if not, melanocyte transfer from suction blister from a normal part of the skin onto one of these depigmented areas. Or recommend a permanent tattoo. You can match any skin tone. And there are very skilled, not sleazy back alley tattoo artists, but there are very skilled tattooists who will do this for medical purposes. Ways you could offer palliation without curing her. And if all else fails, camouflage cosmetics, like Dermablend, where you can perfectly match this. How about this patient? He had DLA that worsens. <laughs> the rheumatologist gave him steroid and azathioprine. The worst part was on his lower lip in DLE. He was sent to us and it's a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Submental, submaxillary nodes ultimately developed lung metastases, but he got palliative Mohs surgery with reconstruction, his whole lip was squamous cell carcinoma, and then got semiplumab, which is approved for advanced squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And no, he didn't look great, but at least he could go out in the society, you know, did somewhat better. Certainly, at least his squamous cell didn't kill him right away. And while he was undergoing that, at least he could say goodbye to his family and friends. Palliative care. Everything from relieving itching and pain and odor and ooze. That was all palliative care. Making tumors smaller to improve quality of life, if not curing them. It's all palliative care. And it's all in your capabilities. And that's why I'm begging you to consider that. And every once in a while, you get this. He had stage four CTCL. He's all red. See the tumors on his, on his scalp. He had tumors everywhere and everywhere. He was offered total skin electron beam as palliative therapy. That's what he looks like a decade later. A decade later, there's no evidence of disease. Every once in a while, palliative care ends up being curative. You never know when that kind of a miracle is going to happen. And it did for him. He died in an auto accident. But the 12 years he had from his radiation, total skin electron beam, to the time he died, unfortunately, were great. And he was so happy that he did the palliative care. That's something you could have arranged. So, in summary, palliation is more than dealing with dying patients. It's symptom relief, improving quality of life without curing disease. You already do it, like psoriasis and biologics. Advanced skin cancer, connective tissue disease, and others are all amenable to palliative interventions that we can either do or we can arrange. We should see to them. 
And sometimes you get really lucky and palliative therapy can be unbelievably effective. Even that guy with the giant melanoma on his back. I mean, some of his metastases shrunk and some went away. Amazing. It's our ethical and moral obligation to patients with serious illness. And I'm begging you, I'm urging you and begging you, don't quit, don't give up. Try everything in your power. And if there are things that can be done that you personally or your office or practice can't do, find someone who can and will. Don't quit on your patients when they need you the most. Palliative care and dermatology. Thank you for listening.